Welcome to Streets Where Forget Podcast. We're back again. Another weekend of in- exercise. I can't even speak. Another weekend of exciting Premier League football. And I'm Doji. I'm here today with Keelan, Louis, and Ralph. We've got the all star lineup today. And we had, I guess you could say, an all star game just now. Luton, our local boys, Luton Town against Liverpool. My favourite team in the Premier League, Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, 1-1 one, one it finished. 1-1. One, one. Um, Louis, you were at the game. Uh, mm-hmm. Ralph Keenan, you were both obviously watching the game, uh, as was I in parts. Uh, I had other obligations as well. But we'll get straight into that game then. Um, we'll, start with, we'll start with you, Louis, as you yeah. were at the game. Yeah. Um, Lewin did you, Lewin did a good showing, man. Like I was surprised. Obviously, I was, I was speaking to the group chat last week, saying I don't really see how Luton can really put a glove on Liverpool. I thought Liverpool were just too strong in the back. Um, the Salah threat as well going forward, but that didn't really seem to be there today at all. Um, and Luton were minutes away. Could have even nicked, nicked it at the end if um, I think it was Kabore made a better decision at the end there, mm. but. Um, I think week in, week out, you're probably growing in more confidence now that Luton, out of the other promoted teams, can be the one that actually stays up. But yeah, what are your general thoughts on the game, um, being in the ground and just witnessing the game? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I don't want to take anything away from us because we were really, really good. Like I think every player did their job today. Um, in the first half, I thought Kabori was a little bit shaky, but then obviously was great second half, got himself the assist. As you mentioned, a bad decision making at the end, but... Look, he's a, he's a young kid and he, he tried to score. Fair enough. Um, I thought we were excellent today. I think uh, Mengi and Osho at the back were amazing. Ogbene, I'm running out of words for this guy. This guy is so good, man. So, so. Honestly, he might be the best free transfer that we've had in the Premier League for a long, long time. He's so good, man. Trent or did any not team or want Luton? anyone in general. Wow. Genuinely, the way he gets us up the pitch, the way he's so fearless, Trent did not want any of it today. They doubled up on him. Him and Kanate were both doubling up on him and he spun both of them three, four times. Um, I think if he had the confidence to shoot when he took took it past four of them, that could have been goal of the season already. He's so good, man. Um, but I think Liverpool in general, and I've said this a lot this season, I think they're mid as hell, man. I think... They're too easy to cut through. We proved that today. We're, we're not very good, but we cut through them like a knife through butter so many times because they haven't got a six. The, the fullbacks can't defend. I think they really miss Robertson in the fact where, look, Gomez played today and he he had a solid enough game when he was playing, but he looked uncomfortable. Um, Trent, this guy cannot defend. I'm, te- I, I'm yeah. genuinely, at times, no, no, no. I, at, no, at times I think it's a myth, but today... He had a shocker. You know where you do that thing? We've all played football. You know where you do that thing yeah, where you get skinned and you pretend to pull your hamstring? <laughs> My man did that twice, bro. My man yeah. did that twice. He, Yeah, he was shocking today. I don't. To be honest, though, I don't know what Klopp's doing with the whole inverted thing because it, I uh, thought it today it restricts his game. He gets the ball deeper and then rather than being able to whip across it, he kind of has to stand it up to the back post. Um, personally, yeah. for me, his best comes from when he's out wide and he's whipping the ball into the box. Um, so I don't understand him being central, which is, again, why I've said I don't think he can play in central midfield because the game passes him by too much. Um, he needs to get out wide and get the ball into the box. So I think tactically that's that's not the greatest from Klopp. Um, I must say, though, that there were times where Kaminsky had to step up. He made three or four very good saves. And again, I think he's an amazing goalkeeper, man. I think he's really, really good. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't impressed with, with Liverpool at all. I actually think their best player... Was um was Harvey Elliott when he came off the bench? I think he was their best player. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a weird one. When Liverpool have played, um, let's say lower opposition at times, uh, opposition we expect them to roll over. I remember FA Cup a couple of years against against the um, Nottingham Forest had a similar game, struggled and only just about got a one nil win. Um, so I don't know. Maybe teams like this actually are suited to play in Liverpool where they can get in a deep block because Liverpool don't really have those players that can really make them incisive passes. Um, or that, those players in the tight spaces that can dribble mm. and, and score like maybe a Man City. But um, Ralph, obviously, I'm sure you took in the game. Mm. Uh, you've just taken in Louis' comments. Um, what are your what are you saying about Luton, man? Um, obviously, you know you've got some allegiances to Luton. Yeah. Uh, 
does that performance give you a bit of confidence going forward or yeah what I, think you... it, I think it does you know because uh, at the start of the season obviously when they came into the league you, you looked at Luton and thought you know it's gonna be a very long day for them um, and I think a lot of people had them to go straight back down again and even most Luton fans would agree that it wasn't about staying up it was more about the experience of being in the league and the money that came along with it but you can see as the season's gone on the confidence in the players is growing and it's they're becoming more of a unit um, I know, don't get me wrong, the football at times isn't fantastic, but we don't expect it to be fantastic. We just expect to get results, and that's what they are. They're grinding out results, and uh, a lot of teams underestimate what the Kenny can do to them. And I think Liverpool definitely did that today. Klopp um, really underestimated what being in the Kenny can do. Um, and it, it showed in the performance of Liverpool. They, they didn't look attacking in times. They looked, um, I think Louis has gone. Uh, uh, he's had enough already. Um but yeah, uh, at times it just looked very lacklustre from Liverpool and it looked like they didn't want to be there. Um, and, you know, Luton on the break, catching a Liverpool on the break was um, something that they, you know, they took the chance at the end of the day and they were very unlucky at the end, I would say, to not have got a second one, which I think would have potentially, I think they were, was, the, was it just before the goal or I'm on the top of my head now, um, where we had the, the chance right at the end. It might have just been after their goal. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Just after. But that's what Liverpool do, unfortunately. That's the Premier League and, and you know, big clubs, they... They do that to you at the end of the day. If you don't go two or three up, you know, don't take those chances, then it will just, they will find a way eventually. And Liverpool are known to doing that. I think the season where they won the league, um, they were just grinding out them stupid little last minute one nil goals. And they just, they're just known for doing that. So unlucky for Luton's part, but a very, very good result in the end, I think. Um, one, yeah. one all, at, uh, you know, against the, the top six side it is a very good result. And, they, you know, they'll definitely take that, I would say. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, yeah, just on Liverpool, though, actually, quickly. Uh, would you actually agree with um, what, obviously, what Lou is saying? Obviously, he's not speaking, speak, singing highly of Liverpool's praises at all this season. Mm. Uh, I've actually, I have been, to be fair, in the group chat, but obviously today, they had an off day. Mm. Um, actually, you know, I'll come to you on that one, to be fair. Um, yeah, do you think that's off day for Liverpool? Do you think, no, they are generally actually just not, not that great of a, a team as, as they have been in recent years. Um, yeah, I'm not, I think they are, obviously they're a bit worse than previously, but they are still a good team. I don't think necessarily they played awful today. I think most other teams that have come to the Kenny have done the same, like um, just yeah, the atmosphere there and just the, how close the fans are to you as a professional football player. I think it's been tough for all the players that's gone there this year. Like, if we're going to be saying like Spurs are having like a great season, I know they won the game, which is obviously a two points difference in it, but they didn't do a great performance in this expectation that you might expect Spurs and Liverpool to both go there and thump Luton. So I think just with Liverpool, they're less balanced than like other teams, but I think what they lack in some areas, they make up in their attack and stuff. And um, yeah, I think they're a bit, yeah, more of a shaky team compared to sort of other teams going for them. But in terms of their season, like they, they should arguably be um, quite higher up the table. Like they're very unlucky against Spurs. Like if you're looking at the rest of the teams in the league this year, I think like, yeah, Liverpool are as good as the rest and um, their results have shown that. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Obviously, yeah, didn't quite catch today's game, but it has been tough for teams at the Kenny. You know, West Ham didn't play great stuff there, 1-2-1. One, one. Uh, Tottenham, very, very fortunate, you know, and they're top of the league. We'll see what happens when Man City go there. So I do think it is a case of, yeah, maybe teams are underestimating Lou. Look, I've even underestimated Lou myself. Um, I did not see, you know, I was worried they weren't going to beat Derby's tally, but it looks like Sheffield United, even though they won this weekend, it looks like they're probably... Um, the most likely to break that record. But um, overall, I guess, you know, the draw, Luton fans delighted with that. Uh, Liverpool fans probably fuming at that. Darwin Nunez, I heard, was missing sitters today. Mate, he missed a big, the biggest sitter I've ever seen. It was like, he he tries too hard in the easiest opportunity. And then the, the opportunity is that he shouldn't be scoring. He's bagging them like it's like yeah. top in. Makes no sense, bro. He, he's just a, he's a strange player, but he's young and he's he's tenacious. And I love him. I, I, no, without saying I love him like that because of fucking he's, he's a Liverpool. But um, you know he <laughs> he's 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 got all the attributes that you want in a striker. Essentially, he, you know, gets on the ball. He's aggressive. He gets in the right areas. He's running. He, some of the positions he pops up in, I just think, how oh, the fuck has he got there? Do you know what I mean? So he's. Um, you know, he, he's a very good player, but he's just finishing is is not his cup of tea, I would say. <laughs> or easy nah. finishing. Easy finishes. 
composure, he lacks it. Yeah, yeah he's been like a great player in like the 2000s era of the Prem, but he's just a bit rough for like the modern sort of Prem era. But like, yeah, his the things he can do, um, yeah, like I said, yeah, his attitude, um, I like it as well. Like, I'd, he's a great player and he's yeah, he's a proper character, but. <laughs> Yeah, giving me um r- real team of Werner vibes at the moment. I-, I do prefer probably him to Werner. I don't know. I think he's got a bit more a bit more dog in him. Mm. But I don't know. Those type of players for me, they're a little bit of a red flag, man. They're a little bit of a red, of a red flag. You're kind of always waiting for them to come good. You're waiting for them to... You're always saying, oh, they're in the right positions. If they get their finishing right, they're going to be amazing. And they're just never, never quite are, you know. Um so yeah, I think that wraps up the Luton and Liverpool talk. Uh, even game one-one, um, not really too much to dive in deep there. It doesn't really change much for both teams. Um, and then we will move on to your boys, Ralph um, uh, and United. Right, the absolute—I call you guys a circus, to be honest, of the Premier League because there's yeah. always something going on. Um, your games are just always—I don't know, man. There's always a story with your games. Yeah. Um, and it finished 1-0, 1-0 to you guys. Bruno Fernandes, your captain, bailing you out. But, you know... But when we talk- bailing out is, is is the wrong word. I think it... The thing is, with that goal, Bruno, he... OK, yeah, Bruno scored the goal, won us the game, and it is a big goal. But apart from that, I didn't see what Bruno was doing in that game. And he was complete passenger the whole time. And it's a paper over the crap's performance. And it's, you know, I, again, every, every week you go into the game, you hear interviews during the week, you, you hear the, oh, we need to do better every time. And we need to do better. We need to do better. You think, oh, okay, maybe this week they'll show us, show us a little bit, show us something they've been working on, maybe a little bit of a tactical uh, difference. And then every week is the same shit. You get, you know, players walking. You get nothing new happening. Build-up play is slow and lacklustre. No one's breaking lines. The best player on Saturday for us was Harry Maguire. In 2023, the best player for us was Harry Maguire. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense to me. Don't get me wrong. I've had my times where I've hated Maguire, but do you know what? I think I think back and do you know what? He's he's had a bit of a tough time, hasn't he, really? You know, compared to some other people in that picture, you're getting no slack whatsoever. The likes of Anthony and your your Mason Mounts and your Brunos and people who are just go and disappearing and putting in zero out of 10 performances. Harry Maguire, fair play to you, mate, because you've had a lot of stick and you've, you know, you kept your football mind on, you kept your head straight and you just kept grinding out. And you're here at the end of the day putting in, I'd say, a nine out of 10 performance yesterday um, in a game which was a, an overall of five out of 10. So, you know, fair play to him, to be honest. Yeah, I, I I think you're right about Maguire. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cool. I th- I think you're right about Maguire, and I think the the criticism of of Anthony and Bruno's fair. Um, I will say, I know you you tied Mount in the same brush. I don't think at the moment it's it's fair for for him to be tied in that same brush because he's new to the team, and also as well the one good game he had against Palace, uh, Baldy decides to drop him afterwards and then not play him for like three four weeks. So I I don't understand if if a player has a good game. And they look they look very good. Why why not play them again and give them 10, 15 minute cameos? And he's he's coming on in games where like you're two nil down to City or you know you're you're two nil down to Newcastle and the yeah. game's already gone. So yeah. you you're basically just bringing him into a baptism of fire. And also as well, when he's been coming on, he's come on in games where McTominay's been the six and the whole team's just disjointed. So I'd like to see Mount in at number ten. I'm not saying it will work. I'm just saying I think it, he deserves a fair crack of the whip at number ten with the, the full team fit, which the full team hasn't been fit for for any games this season, really. And look, the the context you applied is is correct. I agree with the context you applied. Um, but if you look at it out of context, United are only six points off Liverpool and Arsenal, which mm-hmm. I, I know I know it seems crazy to say, but they're only they're only one point behind Newcastle as well. I'm pretty sure, or two points behind Newcastle, six behind Arsenal, Liverpool. You know, top, two, yeah. three bad games from those teams and two, three wins on the bounce for United and they're, they're right back in it again. So, look, and the performances haven't been great, but and, and I, they, as I said on the pod last week, I think I was Ten Hag out. I, I'm kind of, I've had time to reflect on it and I kind of think like this season so far has been a complete anomaly just because there, there's been consistent injuries throughout the season. There's still no Shaw, still no Martinez, Casemiro's out again. Um you know, there's been so many... Rashford's now injured. Um, it just seems like there's a new injury every week. I think from the team that played on 
um, on Saturday, there's probably only the players that played on the pitch plus four or five others that are actually fit to play at the moment. So, mm-hmm. and those four or five others play in the same position as well. Um, in in terms of Mount Hannibal, Bruno, you know, like you can't play all those guys at once. So, uh, I think it, it's I... it's weird. There is some good vindication in there for Maguire in terms of he's come into the team and he's probably been the best player in the team since he's come in. But I think that was always the case anyway. I, I, I never thought Maguire was a bad defender. I just think, you know, he's one of them people who, when things aren't going his way, it looks because he's slow and because he's ugly and because he's got a big head, it, it just it looks worse than what it is. Whereas Lindelof yeah. is handsome. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say it. But he gets yeah. he gets away with murder, bro. He's ten times yeah. worse than, than Maguire. He gets away with murder because he don't have a big head, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear it. I hear it. Um, I don't know though. Like I think with you know there, we have been very unlucky. And I think there, there's been times where um, the referee and and VAR has got a lot of blood on their hands with a lot of the decisions that we've that have gone I against agree. us. I know it's a Man United thing to say. I know we've had and all other teams in the Premier League say so you've had decisions for 20 years and it's always been your way and now it's not. I hear that. I get it. But at the end of the day, we've got to call a spade a spade. And there has been times where this this season especially things have gone against us. That I've seen in other games happening. They've turned a blind eye to it. I'll, I'll go back to the. I know you want to talk about the Arsenal game a bit later on and the travesty in itself. But the same thing happened with Man United, Rashford and Ho- 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 Hoyland's first goal. Nothing. Nothing says not Brian, given. Yeah. I, I'm not saying. I'm. I'm, I'm just saying. Like you, this, well, games like that. Yeah. I get, don't get me wrong. Like it, it's a subjective but it's decision. Right, but it seems like referees are definitely looking for things in the Man United game rather than if it's if it's not clear and obvious they're not giving it they're going with the on-field decision that should mm-hmm. be how it is if it's not clear and obvious and it's the on-field decision is goal or on-field decision is I don't know go with the on-field decision but they're not they're going looking for it and then they're giving the ref- opportunity for the referee to go and make a different decision than what's been given already that's not how VAR should be used it's clear and obvious and that that, that rule doesn't seem to apply with Man United right. and I think games where you get those decisions give the team a bounce and you, you win games from that and you get a few points and and that's how you that's how you get points in the in the Premier League. It's not going to be beautiful football all the time. We don't expect it to be beautiful football, but we need results to go our way sometimes. And refereeing isn't has, has not allowed that. And you know, I'm I'm just saying that's a point that I've seen personally. I don't know how you lot feel yeah. about that. I, I agree. And there's there's two things I want to touch on with, with what you said. I, I completely wholeheartedly agree with everything you've said there. Um, I think look, VAR is VAR. It happens, but the the team who have costed the most this year from United. They've had five goals goals ruled out from VAR. The next team with the highest is two. So there might be a method to the madness there. Um, and also as well, what, what you said about it's not going to be pretty football all the time. I completely agree. I don't think any team have been electrifying this year. I mean, City are coming into it a bit more, but even they started the season and they weren't electrifying. Um, I genuinely think it's down to the number of games that, that teams are playing. We're seeing more and more injuries. We're seeing more and more games where... It looks like teams are stretched. I don't think, as I said, I don't think anyone anyone's been that that good to be honest. Um, I think Arsenal have teetered along. I mean, I've been critical at Liverpool. I don't think they've been good at all. I think tw- twenty three points. I mean, that Wolves game they could have lost that. The game against us today they could have lost that. There, there's games where they've teetered through it. City have lost some games this year. Newcastle haven't looked great in all their games they've played. At Villa have been great at home, but away, like even today, they've lost games. And it, Brighton as well. Brighton have so many injuries. They haven't won in five games now. Um, yeah. I think every team this year has suffered a lot. Um, and yeah, I, I think it could be a year where either City run away with it or a team wins it very, very marginally on, on like 78, 79 points or something like that. Because I think... I mean, I, even even when I no, even when I watch City, I think they're beatable, man. I really do. Uh, it's it's long when they get going and they get the first goal because when they're one nil up, they're so hard to play against. But I do think if you can hit them in transitions and and catch them on the wrong day, we can we can beat them. But anyone else, definitely. But City, they're obviously the best team, um, and they've looked the best still, um, and obviously Tottenham as well. But I think with Tottenham, it's a weird one. It is a really weird one. Um, because we're yet to see them suffer yet. Maybe it's because they've got one game a week, but I do feel like once they suffer a little bit in games or once they lose one game or lose two, they might go on and, and, and lose a couple because you know they've got the new manager bounce, it's fresh, they're playing nice football, but once that runs out, do they have enough to, to go through? Obviously, this is just me talking hypothetically, um, but look, tomorrow will be a, a, a big test for them as well. Um, 
But yeah, other than them and City, I don't think anyone's been that great. And even them, to be honest, I don't think they've been electrifying. I think they've they've been good enough to win games. Yeah, look, I hear that. Like, not many teams have been that great. Same time, like, it's the Premier League and it's the best league in the world. How many teams are going to be great? Um, you think of the season Liverpool and City won. How many teams were great that year? Not many, you know. Um, so, I don't know. I just think, if I'm being honest, like, fair play, United won the game. But you, you can't hide from what you're watching on the pitch. It's not United haven't had one good performance in 11. Mm. That's poor. Um you know, at least yeah. these teams, Spurs have had a good performance against Man United. Second half was very strong. Man City have had a number of great good performances, to be honest. Um, yeah, they've had a few average performances when Rodri's been out. Um, Arsenal, I don't think we've had any great performances, to be fair. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Like, OK, other teams haven't had great performances, but I don't know. I, 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 get, I get a feeling that you guys have this thing that United are just going to click at some point. But I, I see, I see absolutely no evidence of that happening. To be honest, um, like yeah, and, I don't, yeah, I, I don't um, disagree, but I also don't think it's fair to, to to come to conclusions when they haven't actually had a full fit squad yet. And I know other teams. Well, you can have a full nah, fit squad. Yeah. No, but and, even even just having four or five guys back, like. At the mo- from game week two to now, there's been like eight, nine injuries at the same time. Well, if if you, for instance, Shaw and Malassia are both out, then Regulon gets injured. You know that that don't happen normally. You don't have three fullbacks out injured normally. Um, you know, Dallow's had to play. I think Dallow's played. Uh, how like, long? Yeah, Carol. Uh, I was you said how long Shaw been out for though? Like as like I feel like just you've got to look at the money. Obviously, yeah, United spend. And like I said, just with regard to all these players out injured, I just think if they come back, I, I personally just don't think too much changes. Like I said, to quote sort of like Carragher, like, what is Man U's style? Like, no one's really sure. Mm. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, Ten Hag had a good season last year. But I think now, like, there's coming in, getting that new manager bounce. And then there's when your trajectory is down, it's very hard to overturn that. And I just think with the squad United have, like, yeah, they're six points off the top, but I don't, I, I don't see how it gets much better for them um, with regard to that. Obviously, like just the football they've been playing, like it hasn't been mm. sort one, of good one, at all. They they still yeah. got enough to get results against the occasional team. I think a lot of those players come back. You'd struggle to like name the ideal starting lineup for United, and then what? I could name them, Joel. Yeah, I, well, I, I, and then think... with, with that. What would you Karen. expect from that? Like, what's what's the expectation for United at the moment? I, I'd expect I'd expect a higher level of performance, especially defensively. I think that back four last year that kept the most clean sheets in the Premier League. They've played sixty five minutes together this year, and we're in November. Yeah, That's in, like, individually yeah. though, like not, neither, none of them have cut themselves in glory. The Sandro Martinez wasn't good because it's not Ryan. an individual game; it's a team game. Especially when it comes to defending, you defend as a team, you defend as a unit, you def- you defend in a block. I, th- I think Anana coming in and not having a great start hasn't helped that either. He looks like he's settling in a bit more now, so there always was going to be teething problems with that. But it hasn't been helped by the fact that Shaw, who is one of the most press resistant technical players in the team, in terms of you don't really ever see him losing the ball, he's gone. Martinez is is probably the the best at that. He's also out, and then you've got the best pure defender in Varane. He's been out, and then the the thing Wamba Saka well offers. Now. Yeah, the the yeah. thing that Wamba Saka offers is he's the best in the world at it. He's been out, so you lose all of those key components together, um, and you've got guys who come in who who look. Maguire is good, but his his top top level in comparison to Varane's top top level is chalk and cheese. Lindelof's top top level, Evans' top top level in comparison to Lissandro's is chalk and cheese. Reguilon's top top level in comparison to Shaw is chalk and cheese. You know, Dallo Wambasaka, yeah, look, that's not too much of a difference. But the other three, especially, they haven't played at all together. Especially, and there's a new goalkeeper there as well who who doesn't know his defense. So, I think you can draw conclusions, and there's no real excuse for it. They should still be winning games, but. You know, that 1-0 game at Palace, for instance, where United could have won that game, if they win that game, they're three, they're three points off, off top three, top two, you know. Like, you have to apply context to things as well. And I do agree um, in terms of the performances haven't been great, but it's Man United. Everything's bigger than it needs to be. You know, there's one loss and you're in a crisis and then one win and we're back. You know, that's that's just the way it is. Bro, United have lost five games in the Prem. Like, I get it's United mm. and everything's drawn... Um... 
to bigger conclusions than it should be. But like, I'm sure if if City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Spurs, any of the top six losing five out of six, and then the games that they are winning, they're scraping by. So like, people would be saying the same thing. Okay, okay. Uh, where, where were United this season last season? Sixth hmm? with 19 points. This year they're sixth with 18. Who's that? United last season. Last last at this point last oh, season. They, they've got seven of the points, Daddy. Yeah. Last season. Yeah, last yeah, season. United, like, yeah, no, they, they were last season, though. Yeah, they yeah. were sixth with nineteen points last season. Now they're sixth with eighteen points. Same game. But, it, but it, in the in those in those games, yeah, you had the game against Arsenal where you showed good signs, and um, you had the game against same, Liverpool as well. Where same you showed as in the game signs. against Arsenal, Arsenal, Arsenal this year. Game against Arsenal this year, they showed good signs. Uh, yeah, but you didn't win the game. Unfortunately, An- another right? day, another day, the, the Garnacho goal stands and Hoyland gets a penalty. Yeah, th- that, hmm. that's been United's best game of the season. But like, has there been anything else even close to that? And then, you know, even, we're talking about close to that. Like, United didn't win the game. They were just, if I'm honest, like in the game, you know, hence why it was so good. It was, there wasn't really that many bozo moments for United that game. Hence why, you know, it's a, it's a standout game for United this season. But like like I said, there was no Liverpool game last season. United were very, very good. Um, Sancho, Rashford, Martial, great individual performances. Um, that's the thing, you know, we can talk about the defence and everything. We've spoken about Rashford. Um been horrible this season and so has um so has Bruno but obviously Bruno bails them out. Look I don't know man like I think it's a, it's a confidence last... thing. It's, it's mm-hmm. confident it's, co- it's a confidence thing with Man United at mm-hmm. the end of the day. Like yeah. you've got teams who are thriving mm-hmm. off of com- like for instance Spurs and I think Arsenal to to a great extent as well are a pure confidence based type of team. Mm-hmm. You know Arsenal when they had confidence were challenging for the title and then the second their confidence is knocked, you've seen the performances they're putting putting in completely go downhill. And you you think to yourself, okay, you, but you've seen that Arteta's got a style of play, and you've seen what they're trying to do. But without confidence, there's no point being on the pitch. That that it's not working. The you know, passes they would normally come off aren't coming through. Um, and you can see that Rashford's got no confidence. You can see that um, you know there's peak players on that pitch who are literally lackluster when they when they're going for challenges, fifty fifties. There's no confidence in their ability, and that's why we're losing. There was times in the Champions League, I think it's. it's actually the most obvious when you look at it because there's when we played Galatasaray we got one end score fucking great then we go and concede straight away well, what is that what is that about that is just being no, no confidence in your ability to keep your head and be focused in the game that's the simple thing you learn it as a child when you're playing football once you get a goal focus it's still nil nil you've got to keep you got to keep your focus and they're just not they're, they're, they're not they're not 100% there. I don't know what it is. I don't know how Ten Hag's going to come over that. And I think there's a lot of it's off the field stuff. The Sancho situation, Marsh, uh, sorry, the Anthony, the, um, the situation with um, uh, Greenwood for, for, to a great extent, the ownership situation, everything no, externally. You know everything externally. It, it, it does play a part. These players are on social media. They they look at the news. They they listen to Mark Goldbridge. So that they, they, they literally you know a lot of things go around. It's a very big club. Um, and any any minor thing is is front page news. Chelsea, on the other hand, are having a complete stinker of a season. No one talks about it. Why does no one talk about it? Because yeah, it's not relevant. It's like twelve not last year. That. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, yeah like, no, this, this is Chelsea, no the team that won the Champions yeah. League and uh, have got, are meant to be one of the biggest clubs in London, and they're having complete stinkers for two years straight. No one cares because it's, no one, no one cares when you talk about Chelsea. But when it's Man United, it's popular, it's interesting. It's all oh, shit. Sancho, this Ten Hag, that Ten. It's, it's, it's on the ball, but no, no one's saying potch out. No one's saying this. It, it's not, it's not interesting. So there's a lot of pressure on Man United's back, and I think it's, it's, it's a tireless job, and it's a, it's a graveyard at the end of the day when you go to Man United, unfortunately. And I don't know how that's going to how it's going to change, but like I said, mm-hmm. Louis made a very good point. We haven't had a starting eleven this year that I would say is our best starting eleven. Um, and when when the, when the, when that starting eleven starts and the performances don't get good, then we can start being t- uh, talking about Ten Hag out, and maybe something's not right here. But when we haven't got that full starting eleven and we haven't had the chance to see what Ten Hag can do under his plan, then I, I, I can't mm-hmm. really make a judgment on it. I can't. And I think as well, what people don't realise is a lot of these managers, especially the ones who manage the best teams, they have a default 11 that they can rely on and they can go to. United had that last year. Arsenal had it last year. Liverpool on the clock have had it for three, four years, that default 11 they go to. City, I know they've got a lot of different players, but they have a default 11. If it's not 11, it's 9 or 10 who they can go to and they start every single big game or every single time they need a win. United, the default 11 that would play at times, there's only been four or five. In fact, I think from that team Saturday, I think only Hoyland, Bruno and Anana 
That's it. They're the only ones I can see genuinely in the in the in the first starting eleven. And you know, look, they went to they went to an away team in Fulham, who, as Arsenal have shown this year, look, Fulham aren't great, but they're not an easy team to. They, they can give you a banana skin, and there was a professional away performance, and they went and won one nil. Um, so, look, it's doom and gloom, but you have to apply perspective. I think. Ten Hag's tried to tweak the t- the style of play a little bit. I can see what he's trying to do. He's trying to press higher, win the ball higher up the pitch. He made a good point in his press conference last week where he said no teams won the ball in the final third more than United, which is true. And I could see that from the first game against Wolves already, where they implemented that really well. They were high pressing really well, but that leaves gaps in behind. And when you haven't got your default back four and you don't have Casemiro fully fit as well, those gaps are more easily exploited. So I think the tweak in the in the in the tactics and the system in terms of trying to press higher up the pitch, has cost them as well. But when the first team's fully back and once they start to learn from that a bit more, I do think they'll get better. I don't think they're going to challenge for a title or anything like that, but top four or five, I really don't think it's out of the question. Yeah, look, fair enough. I mean, I'll round off my thoughts on that. I just think, I hear it, when the top team, when the main team is back, yes, it could be different. I don't know when the main team will be back, though. that's the issue. I feel like I did see the main team against Wolves. It wasn't very good. Um, so I do think it's a little bit of a myth that United haven't had any of their players really playing fully fit together this season. I, I don't know. I, I don't really fully agree with that. Um, and it's like, yeah, you've got other teams in, in the league now who are better. Like you've got Villa who have got a full season of Emery this time. And you've got um, Brighton who obviously, I know they're teetering, but you know, already beaten United 3-1 this season. So you've got all those teams to compete with. Um no, top four, it, like, it's not, it, mathematically, it's not out of the question. But it's kind of crazy we're talking about that, you know, when United did come third last season. And what I also do think strange as well is I do remember United having quite a lot of injuries last season as well. And um, Ten Hag got a lot of praise because he was able to work with that, get United to um, finals. I even remember the comparisons with um, when Arsenal had injuries. Everyone was like, oh, but look what Ten Hag's had to deal with and look how he's performed in the cup competitions. Yeah, he's not challenging for a title, but he's on... Um, he's able to win, possibly win three competitions. So I don't really know what's happened there. Yeah, those. Uh, can I just caveat that with those injuries that came for United last year came at the, at the back end of the year, because yeah, for for the majority of games that back six was fit. Okay, yeah, no, fair enough. You know, you've had injuries in the in the back six. Personally, I think even that back six when it's when it's when it's on its um. It's on its day, yeah, cool. It's, it can keep clean sheets, but it's it's not it's not ideal. It's not fully ideal, you know. He's still got Wamba Saka, who's got his issues. I think Shaw's got his issues personally. Varane's definitely got his issues. And Sandro Martinez as well, who I didn't really think has his issues, has them as well. So um, mm. I don't know. And then you've got Anana with that as well, you know. It's but actually I, looking like the hey, I might have saved you quite a lot of lot, lot last season because nah, I disagree with that. that forward, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's all rosy. In fact, I don't think it is to be honest. So. Um, and then your main guy, your main source of goals isn't scoring. I think that's ultimately <laughs> we fix so much on the on the back end of the game at the moment. But it's actually up front, man. Rashford's not scoring. Hoyland scored zero, zero and eight. So yeah, look, yeah. for me, something has to be done yeah. about that. I don't know whether a manager changes the answer, but no, I disagree. I don't um, think it is I, at the moment. I, I did, but I don't think it is. And look, I agree with you that the attack's not doing their job as well. But these these things are a very harmonic thing. There's there's a reason why. Pep is obsessed with defending. There's a reason he's obsessed with defenders is because if if that Pep back four... Pep's obsessed with defending, bro. Are you sure? He's obsessed, bro. He plays... How many defenders has he signed since he's been at City? He spent like 700 million on defenders. Yeah. Well, I don't he know, ha- man. Had... I, don't, I, 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 I hear yeah. that, but like... He, he, how many defenders has he signed even in recent times? Ake, Gvardiol, Akanji, Diaz. You know, all of these guys... He, he has so many of these guys because... He knows that if you're solid at the back and you can stop transitions, then if you stop transitions, you're going to have more of the ball naturally. But um, then again, like how many solid certified defenders has Pep had? He's always had, like, there's always been question marks for a bit. There was question marks over Stones, that's why he got Diaz, right? There was question marks over, I don't know who they had left back, but then they got Ake, they got Gvardio. So I think it'd be different if, he, if it was like, um, let's say Arsenal's back four right now. Um, but nah, I don't know. I feel like Arteta is another one. Player, he's he, he's he's keeping them and he's going again. And he might even replace them. You know, up front he's he's replaced yeah. Grealish but already with Doku. Looks Arteta like. is the same, right? Arteta, Arteta loves 
signing defenders as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I personally don't really like that, to be honest. Like, I don't, it's not improved us. The, mm. These guys... I, know, in, recent, uh, in recent times, at all, it's not really improved us, to be honest. Atta- attacking I... starts from the back and defending starts from the front. That's all I was... That's, that's personally... 100% it starts yeah. from the front. They don't keep them. I was just said that argument could so easily just be flipped the other way. Like you talk about like Man City, like defending, like how much defending do Man City actually do? Like their attack, getting things done quickly, which they've done so many times this season, allows them to be able to defend comfortably. And I just think, I, I get your point. I just think you could flip that both ways just as easy. But um, it, when you when you think about it, right? Rodri, even Fernandinho when he was playing, Walker. Um, Nathan Ake, what are these guys so good at? They're so even Bernardo Silva. He, it, people don't think of it. He's an excellent defender. These guys are so good at stopping transitions. Whether that's a foul, whether that's a tackle, whether that's winning the ball high up the pitch, they're so good at stopping transitions that that's why they have so much of the ball. Because when the other team gets the ball, they win it back so quickly. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, what so they then... need to do is be high up the pitch for your attackers yeah. to do their job. They get chances, they create, because there's, if your defenders sit on the halfway line and you, you're comfortable that your defenders aren't letting anything in behind, then you, you've got the freedoms to go and create in the, in the, in the sort of the goal yeah. areas. And that's what you've got to try and do. If, if you're, don't have to a, you don't have to, he doesn't have to track that. I've seen so many times where Hoyland has been on the edge of our box. Yeah, right, defending the edge of our box when he should be literally in in the opponent's half. That's not how you should play football. When you're, when you're trying to play well. traditional football player, you shouldn't have to get back as an attacking player because you should be so confident in your back five, back four, whatever you want to call it. That that's what they do. They play two. They play stones next to Rodri at times in in the transition because they they know that they need to be able to stop that transition. That's why he does it. That's why he's, he's got so many defenders, technical defenders on the pitch because he and knows they, what, they also, what the importance of it is. Yeah. They also have two, well, especially one of the biggest cheat codes in terms of stopping transitions in the world in Kyle Walker. Because any ball that goes over the top, then my man just sweeps it up. So, yeah. that, that you know, like, and how many times have we watched Rodri and how many times have we watched Fernandinho yeah. over the years where you think, how has this guy not been booked when he's made four fouls? Yeah. You know, they're, they're the master of them halfway line little nicks and little shirt pulls that don't, that don't get you booked until it's the 80th minute because they're so good at stopping transitions. They when the other team gets the ball and they get their transition stopped, it's that frustrating. They get the free kick, but then City are back in shape so they can defend properly. Yeah, I agree. They are good at stopping transitions. I just don't think like Pep, um, like I've seen him go Emirates and play Bernardo Silva left back, you know, like he's played Rodri centre back, Fernandinho centre back. Not to say that he doesn't care about defending. I I think he does. I think he's just smart. I think he really takes the defend from the front thing like seriously. You know, how many midfields have we where Pep used to play De Bruyne, Silva and Fernandinho, even sometimes De Bruyne, Silva and Gundogan. You know how light of a midfield that is? Like, I don't know. I think Pep really is a defend from the front first guy. Yeah, cool. Last couple of years, he's put a bit of emphasis on the, on the um, you know, having centre-backs at full-backs. But them centre-backs at full-backs, bro, it's not like you're having, you know, Per Mertzak at full-back. You've got Ake... Vardio um, at fullback, bro. These men are these men are that's, athletes, ve- that's very specific recruitment for that specific thing because he understands the importance of it. And it's the same as I know you said about Bernardo Silva at left back. It's going to sound crazy, yeah, but genuinely, Bernardo Silva is one of the best defenders in the league, bro. This guy, in terms of tackling, winning the ball, he he is insane at winning the ball back. But do you think, do you think he is an insane defender from just? His his style of playing from him, you know, from before he joined City. I think I don't think so. I think it's something that he's obviously developed whilst he's been at City. Yeah, you know? he, he has he has developed that. I agree. You're, you're right, and he he has. I hundred percent agree. He has. Um, but again, this this is very Pep specific, and this is what I'm trying to say about about United, where I can see they're trying to win the ball from the front. And I can see you, the amount of pressures that Bruno is doing, the amount of pressures that Hoyland's doing. Even Anthony, the guy's shit, yeah. The guy's so shit. I'm not going to lie, he's so shit. But he, he, I can see when he plays, he's trying to press from the front. He's trying to be intense. It, he's just shit, like, but, yeah, <laughs> but he's true. trying. He, even, I think the only one who doesn't do it, and this is why I can understand the grievances United have, fans have sometimes, is, is Rashford. Because even when Garnacho plays, he presses from the front. And they, they try and win the ball back high. It's just when they when the press doesn't happen and the midfield, the, the they, other team plays the ball into the midfield, Casemiro just has not got the legs anymore to do it. And McTominay just ends up fouling people when he tries to do it. 
Um, <laughs> and Amrabat, I don't know, like the guy's decent on the ball, but in terms of defending, he's he's he sucks, man. It's crazy to think. I I, I didn't actually catch that much from the World Cup, but I thought he was a, I thought he was an absolute stopper, bro. But nah, clearly he's all right in it. He's 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 just meaty. Like he's yeah yeah. He's all right. You're a Tina player in it. That's kind of what you expect. <laughs> mm. Um. We will move on now to Arsenal. Um, one nil to Newcastle, St James's Park Saturday. Uh, Keep come to you, Arsenal. Other Arsenal fans, alongside me in the this podcast right now. Um, what are your thoughts on the game, man? Um, yeah, so like you should generally to reiterate what you said earlier. Like, I don't think Arsenal has been great um, this year. Like I just think we've looked a, a bit worse than we did last year. And then considering guys like Rice have come in and significantly improved us, it's a bit. Um, sort of frustrating uh, but yeah with the game um, obviously I, I think it should have been a draw um, I don't think we deserve to win um, with regard to the goal for them that stood um, I think the ball was probably in play um, like we can't get a good enough camera angle to see it but I'd think that in with the budget the Premier League has that the same sort of technology they have for goal line tech you'd think it'd be pretty easy to apply for the ball going in and out rather than actually looking at cameras to see if the ball's gone in or out or not um, but I think it's definitely a push on Gabriel like literally as someone that referees um, I've heard referees mention it all the time that when someone puts an arm on someone and they give like it's so easy to give it as a foul because as a player you should never really put your arms on someone like if you look at the rule book you shouldn't be putting your arms on someone like your arms aren't meant to be used in football unless you're a goalkeeper um but the fact that it stood i do get like you get their corners where people are like tugging each other and that doesn't get given i think it's probably one of the most inconsistent parts of football with regards to how it's refereed but when a goal happens and you're actually checking it, i don't see how they can just say oh yeah that goal should stand and um yeah obviously ralph mentioned man united being bad with var and whatnot i think their penalty they got um conceded that hoyland gave away against city like that was like a tug on it. I think that was far less in that for that to be given as a penalty and then for Gabriel to just be shoved, shoved out the way. Like He probably does play it a bit, but then if you're a centre-back and you've got a guy's arms on your back, like that's what you're meant to do. Like You have to play the game. Like, a ref won't give a penalty unless you go down to ground to tell him you sort of want a penalty. Um, but I think, yeah, just with regard to us, I think with the obviously line-up, that left centre mid for always going to cause us issues over the season like we've got great depth but yeah I'm not convinced about Havertz I'm not convinced about Vieira there I'm hearing people saying like Partey will be there when he sort of comes back but I'm that's not Partey's position like he hasn't played there um for us um at all as long as I can remember um but yeah I think that VAR decision obviously means that Newcastle get the three points and we get our first loss of the season and I think I just don't get how the VAR room can look at that and think, oh, yeah, um, goal stands. Like, mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I will give my thoughts in a sec. Um, but that is probably literally pretty much my thoughts. Um, Ralph, I haven't actually heard your thoughts, to be fair, on Arsenal this season. Also, it's been some Louis uh, again. Yeah. But, um, again, same as... Same question I'll ask you and your thoughts on the game and also you know you've got to obviously give your touch on the goal as well yeah I think um it it's, it's one of them games because you're especially at the highest level where you're playing another team who are I would say relatively there and thereabouts in the top three and I would say Newcastle this year are really going to try and push for the title um it, it's one of those decisions that you have to get right because it's so such a high stakes game um, I know it's early on in the season but these games do matter when it comes down to the final final bit so you think oh we're three points off we could have been you know above or slightly thereabouts if we'd got that game against Newcastle um and I think it, it for, for there and I I know that Arteta said a lot after the game, and I do agree with a lot of what he said um, in terms of officiating in this league. It is terrible. And Keely, you made a good point about the, the, the goal line technology on that. The, the refereeing in this country is abysmal. You know, and I feel sorry for, don't get me wrong, Sunday league refereeing and all those things, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm going to leave them out of it. But for the Premier League, one of the highest funded leagues in the world and got the, all, the, all the eyes on it, the refereeing in this country is abysmal. It is it's absolutely terrible. And the fact that I think Arsenal had it last year when you play when you played Brentford, was it? Where there was a clear, clear offside goal. 
and they didn't look at it. They forgot to they forgot to look at it. How on earth has that happened? How has that happened? Are you, I don't get me wrong. I, I don't like Arsenal, and it makes me happy when you lose. But I did feel sorry for you yesterday. I felt sorry for you because I think to myself, that's a game. I don't get me wrong. I don't think either side does. Uh, it was it was an, it was a it was a tight game. You know, both both sides had the moments. And the Havertz thing, I think you probably you may have your thoughts on that on the Havertz situation. Um, but in terms of that goal, I don't think it should have stood. You know, in, in any other game, that doesn't stand. If that's against Brentford, that doesn't stand. If that's against a lower team, that doesn't stand. We all know that what what the referee, and that's three opportunities there for the referee to step in and say that's not a goal. And for some reason, I don't know if it's the, the oil money coming into it. I, I've got a theory about oil money, but I think it's oil money. Um, referee decisions going going for the oil money teams. Um, but, you know, that's that's just me. But at the end of the day, that, that, that goal shouldn't have stood. Um, I'm lucky about losing there, by the way, boys. But, it, <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> no, winning on a Saturday is not for everyone. Um, but no, yeah, at the end of the day, that, that goal is, is is a controversial one. And it seems like it's every week we're talking about controversial decisions in this league. It feels like every week. And if it's against you, it's the fucking worst. If it's for you, then you sort of turn a blind eye, which I don't like. But you have to kind of step, you have to stand up sometimes against, even if you don't like the team like I have now, and just call out bad refereeing and, and bad VAR decisions. Yeah. Um... I hear it, man. Refs in this country, I don't know. It's, it's year and year on. They're just more of the topic, and it's 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 kind of tiring to talk about, to be honest. Um, but I don't know, man. Like I think Arteta is a smart guy. He's coming out absolutely acting in his press interviews about you know how he's been here for twenty years, and this is the worst it's ever been, bro. Please coach your team to attack, man. We're fifteenth in the league for big, big chances created. I mean, that is terrible. I'm pretty sure I mean, you have less chances Arsenal. created than us. I'm pretty sure you have less than us in Luton. I'm pretty yeah, sure you have less. less than Arsenal have less chances created than, than Luton. You know, that says it all. Um, I do blame a lot of it on him, you know, because it was his decision to replace Xhaka. I'm not saying it was necessarily his decision to get rid of Xhaka. I think Xhaka probably wanted to go. His decision to replace him, sixty-five million at his hands. He's he's got gone and bought Havertz. Um, and whilst Havertz wasn't necessarily bad in the game, it's like, you know, people even said he was good. And I, and I hear it. He, he was, like, I could, I can see why people thought he was good, but he just doesn't bring what we need. And it's just going to be like that every game. That's that's his max, you know. That midfield there, Jorginho, Rice and Havertz, like, what is that? You know, you've got Havertz in there, doesn't really know where he fits in the midfield. Jorginho, cool, he's a six. Rice is a six as well. You know, he's trying to shoot on Rice into the box-to-box role. Rice is looking like, at times, our most attacking midfielder. You know, like, Arteta saw it out. Like, I don't think that was in the plan at the start of the season. And I'm, try- I'm thinking now, what was the plan at the start of the season for our midfield? Then, obviously, I want to get on some individuals as well. You know, everyone's having to go at Eddie and Ketty. Yeah? yeah, I don't think Eddie was great. But where's his service, man? Like, Martinelli is getting the ball with a touchdown. He's, he's, he's hoofing into Rosette. And then Saka's becoming the most predictable winger in the league at the moment. You know, he's cutting inside. There was that like one in the first half. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. You, might, you might be a scholar, man. Saka's becoming so predictable, bro. And, and I think at the moment, he's so overprotected. You know, I'm hearing he's played this many games, he's had that many games. Bro, if you're a top player, you're going to play against Newcastle away, bro. You're going to play in a top four clash. Like, I'm not trying to hear about tiredness when you're, you know, you've, you, you've got a shot, chance to shoot and goal and you're cutting back. You know, so Eddie's not really getting service and we don't expect Eddie to drop in. That's not his game, you know. Mm. Fair enough, he's not necessarily the most clinical finisher, but his game is literally seconds, you know. So if that game isn't the one to suit him, then why is Arteta playing him? Why isn't he not playing Havertz or even Trossard, who's at least going to come deep? Our defence yeah. is fine, to be honest. I mean, David Raya's making loads of... He's not even making loads. He's making one mistake a game. I think it's, it's leading to it being cost goals. But... um even him, you know, I can see, I can see how he's an upgrade on Ramsdale. But again, why is Arteta putting so much emphasis on getting a goalkeeper when you know our attack's not even perfect? We haven't got a killer up front. Yeah. And then, you know, the reason I get onto Saka Martinelli quite a bit at the moment is because we know our fullbacks aren't flipping Carl Walker, Andy Robertson, Trent, who are gonna really provide that attacking impetus. So a lot of it is on them. You know, they're kind of, especially with Odegaard out as well. Who's get, he's getting a lot of criticism compared to Sacra Martinelli, who's getting pretty much no criticism. You know, they're going to need to do a bit more. Um, mm. And then as for the goal, look, yeah, like, it, I, I don't think... In real time, when I first saw the goal, I didn't think, that, that's got to be this loud, but I didn't think, that looks a bit funny. 
more because of probably Raya's um, antics. But then obviously, yeah, you slow it down. Yes, it is a push in the back in Gabriel. And it's the action, I think, that counts, not the necessarily the, um, you know, how much damage was done. Because as I said, Hoyland puts a little arm around thing, um, Rodri, and that's um, that's a penalty. Whereas it wasn't the, it wasn't necessarily the most um, cynical of challenges. So, like, yeah, it could have been given, but you still had 25 minutes after that. You had 90 minutes. How many shots did you have on target? One? Mm, one, one shot on target, bro. Mm. Like, Pep Pope didn't have a mistake to make. And I don't yeah. know, man. After everyone's saying we've got more control. Like, do we, bro? Do we? Like, I don't think we do because Chelsea at home. So Chelsea away, right? We we draw. Last season, we'll win. Mm. Um, Newcastle away. Last season, when we draw. We lose, in fact, sorry. Um, Tottenham this, this season, we haven't beat one. We won last season and forgot the other team. But it's like, we we got to win the league, bro. we got to get more than... We were so good last season and that wasn't enough. I don't see how the hell we're going to make... Get even more points when we look toothless at the moment, to be honest, man. And it's been coming, man. Lens game was terrible. West Ham game was terrible. We beat Sheffield United 5-0. So does everyone. Like, I'm not really trying to hear it. We beat Man City without... <laughs> Man City had Kovacic and Rodri in midfield. Like, not Rodri, sorry. Flipping... Nunez, of course, we're going to be. Um, um, so yeah, that is my that's that's my take on Arsenal. Very disappointing. I don't really know where we even go from here. I know it sounds like a exaggeration, but it is an exaggeration. FA Cup. It's an exaggeration. How's it an exaggeration, Louis? Well, the, at, at this exact same points I made, I made for United. Oh, well, you got players to come back. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 not even that. You're, you're three points off off City still, um, and you haven't clicked yet. I don't. I agree. I don't think you have clicked. Again, yes, you have players coming back, but Party was always going to get injured. That's he. He's, he was born injured. Um, I've got a couple of things to say in regards to. Uh, do you know? What? I'll start with the the whole VAR fiasco. Right. I'm one of the the very very few who didn't have an issue with the with the goal standing, and I, I'll say why. So the ball going off the pitch. Obviously, if the ball goes off the pitch, it should it should get disallowed. But um, there's no way of us conclusively telling if the ball went off or not. There should be technology in place to be able to, to say that, to predict that, like, like Keelan said. If they've got it for goal line, why can't they have it for touchline? Um, but there's no way of proving the ball was in or, or it wasn't in. Um, I think the only person in the entire stadium who knows if it was in or not in was, um, was it Almoron who got the ball? Or was it Wilson? Um, yeah, uh, it was it was um, Joe Willock, I think. Joe I think Willock, Joe okay. Willock. I feel, why I feel is that? Well? I mean, literally watch the Tottenham Suns goal. <laughs> we yeah. wait for, we wait... The ball's going off and no one just runs to it. I yeah. don't know. I don't know what Ben White's doing either. Both of those goals, but anyway, yeah. go on. Um, yeah, so I think he's the only one in the stadium and maybe a couple of fans who were seen watching it from the side. Uh, one, Even they don't know, to be honest. But I think, yeah, no one can conclusively say without the technology whether or not that was um, over or not. Um, the foul, I'll be, I'll be so real. I don't think that's a foul, man. I was. I know he's got two hands on his back and whatever, but when you actually watch the clip, yeah, in in slow in real time, before Joe Linton's hands even come near Gabriel's back, he, Gabriel's leant forward like that. So he's bros ducking already. It's like he's trying to initiate the contact with Joe Linton before it actually comes. It, for me, you're a big centre half. Be a big centre half and head the fucking ball away, bro. Why are you trying mm. to initiate contact with someone to, to win a free kick? I hate when defenders do that and they, they get away with it so much. You get a little tap on your back. The referee gives you a free kick. It pisses me off. You need to start clamping down on it, making making people tougher. It's one of my pet hates with centre-backs when they get bullied. Don't you think well, Harry Kane does that quite a lot, though? Like he, he, he initiates challenges from the defender and he wins loads of fouls that way. Mm. Pretty much the same I, thing, though. I expect that from a forward, though. I expect... Uh, you know, a foul's a foul, no? No, but if you're if you're a centre half and rather than actually just getting the ball away and, and heading it away, you're trying to initiate contact with a forward. How many times did we see John Terry do that or Van Dijk? We don't we don't see them do that. They trust themselves to, to head the ball away or Vidic or someone like that. If you're a good defender who's worth your your weight in goal, Sergio Ramos, you jump up, you win the header. You're not you're not leaning forward to try and initiate contact with with a forward yeah. to get. A penalty, and also as well. I know in slow mo it looks bad, but he he doesn't actually push him. He's got hands. Where else does he put his hands when he's jumping for a header? By his no, side. you don't you don't leverage yourself up on someone though. And like you say, he's like he's initiating not. contact. Like he had two arms on his back. If he tried move back into that ball, all Joe Lintasadu just tense his arms, and it like 
Gabriel stopped. Like Jolinton's whole body is going to be stronger than Gabriel. Like that's just what. Like if someone felt like you don't put your arms on someone's back, and he's obviously probably prolonged it about how long it should look like a foul for. But then from that position, like there's no matter what Gabriel tried, he wouldn't have been able to defend that with Joe Linton's arms on his back. So I have a question for you. If it's the other, if it's the other way around, and Gabriel pushes Joe Linton like that, is it a penalty? Huh? If if it's the other way around, and Joe Linton has his hands on Gabriel like that, taken off your Arsenal bias, is that a penalty? What? Well, yeah, they're the other way around properly. Like, if it, I don't think it is, man. I really don't think it is. I think because obviously, I, I, if you, your goal site, if you're in front of a player, that's you've done something right. Your Gabriel was in the better position. He'd got himself in front of Joe Linton as you are taught to when you're defending. And then he leads if Joe Linton done it the other way around and Gabriel could only sort of get the ball by shoving him in front of the ball, yeah, that's a penalty. I, I don't I don't think it is. I think it I think the game's way, way too soft if if that's if this is a talking point so if if he's like rugby tackled him or he's grabbed him and thrown him to the floor fair enough but it's a contact sport bro like I, I, re- I really don't think it's not like he's assaulted him he's literally jumping Gabriel's leaning forward as he's jumping he's put his hands out like you do when you jump you don't jump with your hands by your side and Gabriel had his hands out as well so if there was someone in front of Gabriel like it's just how you jump as a human being there's nothing I, I don't think it's it, it's on the flip side if he would have ruled it out and he would have deemed it as a foul I'd have said fair enough but uh, for me personally, I don't think there's enough contact in that to um, to make it. There. But then that being said, if it happened to Luton, I'd, I'd be kicking and screaming, saying um, that that it's a foul, obviously. Um, but but me looking from a, a a neutral perspective to this, I dislike Newcastle as much as I dislike Arsenal. In in all honesty, uh, and I would have loved to have seen a draw in that game. Um, but for me, I just think firstly the keep has to come and grab it. Secondly, Gabriel has to be, he has to be a, a centre half there. He has to he has to get rid of that if he sees the danger. And third, um, you didn't even react when Willock went out wide and got the ball. So um, you know, we can talk about referees and VAR decisions all we want. And look, if you feel aggrieved, you feel aggrieved. But at the end of the day, um that, that whole sequence doesn't happen if, if Arsenal react how they should. I agree. I agree. And um that's a point I was going to make, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, just just to be honest, if it was the other way around and Arsenal got that goal disallowed, I'll be fuming. As as with every Arsenal fan, and no Arsenal fan can tell me they wouldn't be. That's why I can't really get too mad at the goal. We didn't do enough. Um, forget even the game, as we said, doing that instance of play. That is not Arsenal doing the most we could have done to prevent that goal. So it's like, <laughs> oh, it's like that's 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 that's, that's just what, that's that's just what's yeah. gonna happen. You leave you it play stupid pri- you, you play stupid games. You win stupid prizes, man. At the end yeah. of the day, and you've got you. But yeah, I think so. Obviously, football's not played in still images, but VAR is entirely based on still images, and you've got to look at Joe Linton's intention. It's like it's a goal between two teams that could either of them could easily win the title by the end of the year. What is Joe Linton? What is his good intentions from putting his arms on Gabriel's back. Like, like literally all defenders, that do, obviously I've said corners stuff, everyone's grabbing each other. It's so inconsistent to when a penalty or something is given for it or when it's actually sort of intervened. Because most of the time it'll be sort of attacking team takes corner, defensive team are very sort of grabbing players. Ball goes out of play, um, ball gets cleared, it's done. But this thing, like, a goal that so they've reviewed, I did, Gabriel should, um, Joe Linton shouldn't have his arms on Gabriel's back and I think it makes it incredibly hard for Gabriel to defend that properly. When Where should his hands be though? Massive Joe Linton, and not on Gabriel's back, like, and they're on his back for a while. It's not like he just jumps and puts him there. They're there before he jumps and I just think, like, it's whether Joe Linton actually shoves him or not, he is trying to cheat. And whether he, he actually is. does mm. that or not, we, we don't know if he's <laughs> tensing his biceps or not. But you don't, he's, he All knows right. what he's doing. Like, and okay, I think so in the so, still image, yeah. his intentions are clear. Okay. And they on the flip slept. side then, on the flip side, by Gabriel trying to initiate that contact by bending over, is he not trying to cheat in the same no, then? Joe Linton's already put his arms on his back at that point. No, he's so, not. If you if you watch it, when the ball comes in, Raya goes to stop it. Gabriel is is leaning forward before Joe Linton comes into him. He's leaning forward. 
He initiate they both initiate that contact. For me, it, it's a case of Joe Linton is is genuinely trying to win the ball. Whether or not he commits a foul in the process of trying to win the ball, he's trying to win the ball. I think Gabriel has completely fucking bottled it and is trying to win the is trying to win the free kick. Like I see a lot of defenders do nowadays because referees give them all the time. Even when they're in the corner flag, they'll get a little tap and they'll chuck themselves to the floor. Um, I, I think he's bottled it completely. And I think Joe Linton's... Tr- Look, we don't know what Joe Linton's intentions are and we don't know what Gabriel's intentions are. This is just the way I'm interpreting it. I, I genuinely think Gabriel's trying to initiate the contact. And maybe maybe Joe Linton's trying to gain that advantage as well. But if it's then half a dozen of one and ten of the other, who's in the wrong and who's in the right? I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Arsenal, go back to the very, very start, Arsenal didn't do enough to win the game. Um, and you can't, you know, when it comes down to big games like this, if that chance happens for Arsenal, then, you know, it's a different conversation at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, I just think you you guys genuinely don't look as, you know, I think you said it last year, uh, don't you, as well. You don't have killers. You're not killers. You don't kill games off. You don't have that killer instinct that a Man City has. And for some you know, this year, it looks like Newcastle have that killer instinct. I think you just you were just victims of that uh, yesterday. The fact that they, they do have that, sort of killer instinct in them. They'll go and slap a team just because they can and that they're scoring freely and they look a little bit more dangerous. That whole sequence was just a bit of a mess from Arsenal from the ball to Wilson. I know he's, he's, he's fucking put it to the corner flag, but that whole sequence, they were in on goal at the end of the day. Like they, they were, they, you know, your, your players were falling over each other. Ray was all over the place. Like the, the whole sequence of defending kind of allowed that, that situation to get to where it was. And, and the fact that you should have had 10 men as well, that could have been a lot worse for you. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. That's the red card. That that is it's just the red card for Havertz. Uh, you know, there's no two ways about it. I don't know how that's not been given. And if you'd go into ten men there, different story. It could have been two or three. So, as much as you know, you may feel aggrieved by the decision. I do. I do think that the decision is probably there. The, you know, it, it shouldn't be a goal. But at the end of the day, you know, Arsenal didn't do enough to win the game, and you you could have had ten men, and you should have had ten men, and it probably would have been a lot worse if you did. So, the, the, you know, it swings around about it. It's a bit of a, it leveled itself out at the end of the day, I think. I'll give Arsenal some credit as well. I think Gimaraes was lucky to be on the pitch as well as Havertz. I think both of them were. But again, that that sets the precedent of the referee. I, I genuinely think he was trying to make the game flow as best as possible. I personally, I would rather a referee not give dubious decisions. I'd rather him just let the, the on-field decision go on because that's the football we love. We don't like football over-analysing, over-stipulating, over-checking everything. I would rather goal stand. If if Joe Linton's assaulted him and, and grabbed him by his shirt and chucked him to the floor, cool, check the VAR, but he, he hasn't. So um, And it's the same as Havertz. If Havertz makes the contact and, and wipes him out, it's a red card. But I'm happy with a referee to let the game flow and, and let these decisions off as long as we get a good game of football. And for me personally, that's one of the best games of football I've watched all season. I know there wasn't a lot of goals, but I thought it was so interesting, man. Yeah, no, definitely. It was an advert for the Prem in terms of like the tenacity, um, the passion that was shown. Um, and I, I, I do agree, um, to be honest, that, yeah, like both players could have got sent off. But but the main thing is, yeah, the ref actually did let the game flow, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I'm just... It's really annoying because I, I, I thought going to St. James's Park is going to be a tough day. We're not going to get much change. But actually, there were so many openings in the first half where I thought during the second half, I was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, they're gonna open up even more, and we're gonna just go for the knockout blow, and we just didn't. Yeah. And that, that that's what's so annoying about the game is like Newcastle didn't actually stop us playing really. Like we went there and looked like the home team, to be honest. But. I do we think around you... the box. Like honestly, watch every instance we're around the box. Try and see how many times Saka and Martinelli actually go by a line and, and get it in. Right. And if they're doing that and then Ketty's getting the ball around the box and he's he's fluffing his chances, which he, he might have even still done, I can be a bit like fair, but I just feel like Eddie is just in this situation, he's the easy, easy target. Well, I mean True. like when he's 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 you know, he's got five goals this season, it's not amazing, but you know, that's our top scorer, you know. So Free against Martin's Chicago. got to look at that for me. He's yeah. got to look at that, man, because we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll struggle to make top four if, if, if we keep playing like this, genuinely. Yeah, I think, I, I think yeah. um, look, I've been a big critic, criticiser of him, not because I think he's a bad player, but I, I don't think he's 
as amazing as people make out, but you, you, I, I do think you really missed Odegaard yesterday in terms of a player being calm and picking the ball up in the pockets and, and making things tick and making things flow. I do think you really missed that because um, Havertz battled really well and so did Rice. And look, Jorginho, I don't think he was bad. He doesn't really offer much. But for me personally, I, I would much rather, if I was an Arsenal fan, have Odegaard in there, um, even when he's not having his great game, even when I don't think he's very good creatively but I do think he keeps things ticking in terms of he doesn't lose the ball and he picks the ball up in the pockets and he'll, he'll play it sideways to Saka and get him one-on-one -on -one in good areas so you did miss him yesterday yeah 100% missed him um to his any talk of him at the moment not being in our best 11s just crazy you know because yeah Fabio Vieira I like him I like him but <laughs> I think the tacticals are making him out to be a player that he's not quite at the moment so um why, why is yeah. he not playing? Why, why is he not playing though? Why? Why is? I don't know. I would have played him. I would have rather played him than than Havertz yesterday. Definitely rather yeah, play him than Havertz. I, I mean, if, I, if you play Havertz, just play him up front. Like, I, I can't be asked yeah, to play this guy in midfield, bro. Like he's just he's not probing enough. Um, and then don't, Jorginho is just genuinely El Nenny's better than Jorginho. Like it, I'm genuinely being serious. Like El, Jorginho. Oh my days! Don't even get started. He's so they're dead. both pretty much the same player, to be honest. I'm not gonna lie. They are. They both pretty much offer the same thing. They're just nah, bro. Oneni, Oneni at least offers the same dynamics. Part A does, but just, <laughs> just to, just to a lesser standard. Jorginho's got no disguise in his passing. Defensively, he's flipping non-existent, bro. And apparently, he's a leader, which I don't, I don't really see. I don't know why he's captaining us, like. Oh, bro, why are we still buying off Chelsea? Like, <laughs> Chelsea's broad. Chelsea have made a bag off of really meaty players. They got they've shipped off Mount, they shipped off Jorginho, they shipped off Havertz, and they've made tons. Like they're, they're yeah. laughing to the bank. Todd Bowley yeah, is ducking and diving it. FFP like it's bloody total yeah. wipeout, man. He just yeah. he loves it. He loves it. And that's not even yeah. including the players they sold to Saudi. Yeah, yeah. the thing is. Yeah. It's true, they've made bank, but they've they've not got better for I actually think they'd be a better team with, with Havertz up yeah. front rather than Jackson and I think they'd be a better team with, with Mount in there probably. And you know what, right? Like They were. <laughs> yeah, they were. And, and yeah, look, yeah. Enzo Enzo is a good player, but I mean, does he offer like that much more than than Jorginho, considering he was a hundred million? I think he's obviously much better, but you know, for a hundred and like I don't think they've got much better for it. So I don't necessarily think those. I don't think those guys they sold as individual players are bad players. I just think the situations they find themselves in aren't aren't the best for them right now. Um, especially with Havertz, I don't I don't see why he's never been a midfielder ever. Um, I don't yeah. I don't understand. Even when he was a midfielder, he was a number ten who would who was kind of like a deli alley where he'd attack space. So I don't understand um, why he's yeah. he's been forced to be a box to box midfielder. Is it because he's tall? I don't know. Yeah, because he's tall. But even that, even that, that statement's kind of worrying, you know, saying he's like a Deli Ali. Yeah. because Deli Ali was. <laughs> where is he now? You know. Yeah, I, th I think I think he's a, a Deli Ali or a Thomas Muller type of player where he yeah. he will thrive on on attacking the space that's left. And I think actually as well, Van der Beek at United is very much that type of player as well. Um, I just don't think in this, this country. Is not great company, man. I'll be real. No, nah, but I. I do you want it <laughs> I don't think, I, I think the only country, the only nation that knows how to use those players is Germany. I don't think any other, yeah. any other nation knows how to use those players. Yeah. Um, that is true. So, yeah. I'd yeah. also say, like, I'm like, a thousand percent sure if Joe Linton didn't do that transition for Newcastle, like, Arteta would have tried it with Havertz. Like. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I yeah. think it may, like, copy in Eddie Howe's tactics because. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it would have just been boring to sign some guy that's actually good there and has performed well there for a few seasons. Yeah, but the thing that don't make sense—I I do agree with you actually. But the thing that don't make sense is Jolino. Jolino is actually a unit, whereas Habits is just a streak of piss. Like he, <laughs> he's, like, bro. There's no size about him whatsoever. He's just tall, bro. He's he's he looks yeah. like. You know, you know them brothers, yeah, who were like 15, 16, and they had a growth spurt where they went from like 5'8 to like 6'1, yeah, and they don't understand how to be tall. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, they don't know their body, innit? That's that's what he's like. It's like he had a, a growth spurt bare late and he's not used to being tall. Yeah, I think so as well, to be honest. Um, no, he does put himself about in it. Like, he, he, has, he, is, he is good in the jewels, but at the same time, like, bruv, just. 
Right, yeah, I'm that's that's so is James Milner, bro. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah. man, like, do, do you know, do you know me, what it reminds me, me of? It reminds yeah. me of um, we we've got Adebayo at Luton, and he, he I always say like this guy, if he actually understood the body he has and the strength and the size that he has, he'd be so good. But bro, bro thinks he's he thinks he's fucking Ronaldinho trying to do dribbles and shit like that. But get the ball, chest it down, knock it on, get in the box. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't be trying to do these runs and these dribbles, man. You're not that guy, bro. You're you're a big guy. You're you're a good enough player, but you're not you're not him. Nah, definitely not him. Definitely not. But yeah, it's, it's a thing with tall players. To be fair, even when, even when I play football, I'm probably a bit like that as well. So there is something in that. Um, but yeah, we'll just round off then. Uh, just talk about like... Let's talk about Kane actually quickly. Kane, um, he's already... Bayern's, um, he's matched Bayern's top scorer take from last season or this season, which is crazy. Um, Hat-trick in the, the Classica. Uh, and he needs just one more goal to equal last season's um, top score tally for Bundesliga, which is crazy. Um, most goals in Europe at the moment this season, 17 goals. Um, you know, he's got to be, a f- at the moment, one of the front runners for Bandor next year, which is, yeah, wild. Uh, no, he, he won't, unfortunately, be Ballon d'Or competition because you, you, you've seen how the Ballon d'Or runs. Yeah, they'll give it to Messi. <laughs> You've uh-huh. seen how that how that works. So, um, yeah, Kane's nowhere near. He doesn't he doesn't sound or look the part, unfortunately. Um, you know, imagine him trying to give a a, 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 a congratulations speech. You know, oh. like one front row is soaked. Like, <laughs> <laughs> low, key, yeah. low key, it's the same as Messi, bro. Like Messi can't even make eye contact when he's talking. He's autistic, isn't he? Poor yeah. Poor yeah. yeah, but he's yeah. good with his feet, so let him off. Mm. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, no. It'll be, it'll be. They'll give it to someone like it'll be. It'll be depending on what Haaland does this year and Mbappe does. Um, you've got no uh, international football for this. Uh, well, you've got twenty twenty four, haven't you? It'll be slightly after. I don't know. It, it depends. It depends. I don't think anyone's really lit up the world so far, apart from Kane. So he, he has got. He has got. He, he's got a sort of a say there. But you know, it's, it's a long old year, and it we'll see how things progress. Um, but I'm, mm. I'm happy for Kane because I think he, he he's a play, he's probably the only player I think who deserved to get a trophy and to win because he put so much in um, for his for a very long career of being you know putting in goals and numbers but never had the trophies to back it. So fair play to me, he's English. Every day you know it's good to see. Mm. So yeah, he deserves it. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, I think they'll give Haaland the Ballon d'Or next year because they feel bad for not giving him it this year. Personally, you know, like Probably. he could he could have not as good a season, but I think he'll be the winner next year. Unless unless Mbappe does something crazy, um, at, yeah, he won't. So I think <laughs> whoever, won't. whoever wins the Champions League will probably win it. I'll put it that way. If yeah, you, win, you, then... you might go to Hoyland, man. United might win the Champions League. I might go to Hoyland. You never know, bro. <laughs> I might win the Champions League. I might yeah, be for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing, yeah, Kane, man. Do you know, I actually love this guy because he's gone there and he's he's breaking his goal scoring records. But then they get, get knocked out of the cup by a third division team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're not even top of the league. They're, yeah, they're not even top of the league. It would be the most Harry Kane thing to score fifty goals, come second, and not win anything. <laughs> yeah. Crazy man. History of the Harry Kane. It's, it reminds me of that um, that Gary Neville thing where it's like this was the banker, the one that couldn't fail, <laughs> the one that's never failed. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Crazy. Uh, just quickly, then we'll just talk of the band door. Um, go around the room. Keenan deserved winner. Messi, yes or no? Um, no. And yeah, just fuck Fabrizio Romano for spoiling that one for everyone. He needs to wind his neck in on some of his fucking journalism. Um, but yeah, um, simple, simple answer, no. I don't think Messi is the best player in the world at the moment. Mm. Ralph? Uh, yeah, I think he deserved it. Um, at the end of the day, the World Cup is the World Cup. It was... It was his year. It was it was the end of his probably his last Ballon d'Or, and I think it should be his last. But you know, Harland, don't get me wrong. I think Harland has a very big case to win it. Um, but you know what the Ballon d'Or is like. You know what you know. It's always going to be about Messi. It's, it's always going to be his show. It is. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's just one of those things. It is one of those things. You, you can't tell me that 
Messi's performance in in the World Cup didn't wasn't a Ballon d'Or performance. That's why Martinez won the the goalkeeper award. It was a World Cup. It was about the World Cup at the end of the end that he won it. So you mm. can't really say no. Um, but I do think it's wrong. I, I I don't think it's right that he won it. But the, how it's based, yeah, he, he should have won it. Yeah, I, I get that. With the format of Ballon d'Or, you think yeah. should have won? It? Yeah. Mm. Louis, do I even need to ask? No, you don't. But because um, you know my answer, but. Mm. Um, for the video perspective, I will say um, Messi deserved the Ballon d'Or for the performance in the World Cup. There's always it's always been World Cup favourable. If you think to O two, I think um, Ronaldo um, R nine. I think he played like fourteen games or something in two thousand and two uh, club games. I think he scored like seven goals or something like that. And then obviously an incredible performance in the World Cup and wins the Ballon d'Or. Cannavaro won the Ballon d'Or. Um, you, you even go far as far back um, into the eighties, where Russia got to the semi-finals and they, they, the World Cup player of the tournament, won the Ballon d'Or then um, for well the USSR. Um, so I think you go, you go as far back in history as, as possible from when Ballon d'Or existed. It's always gone to the. If there's a sta- an absolute standout player in the in a World Cup team that wins it, then that that um, player will win the Ballon d'Or. So Messi does deserve it, but I would also caveat that by saying Haaland also deserved it as well. Um, if if Haaland won it, I wouldn't have been mad. Um, but I think there's a couple of reasons why Messi won it. Obviously, the World Cup, but also as well, I think, and I'm sure you will felt it as well. When Messi won that World Cup, it kind it felt right. It it felt like it it was meant to happen. It felt like the stars are kind of aligned. So I feel like because I, like, I'm a storyline guy, man. I love I love the story. I love the romanticism around football. I, th- I think the perfect story had the perfect ending and. The, the the perfect show in football got you know that was that was a Ballon d'Or not just for the World Cup but it was also kind of like the the cherry on top of the ice and on top of the cake for his career in terms of giving him the Ballon d'Or um, which people say maybe it shouldn't be given like that but I think the way professionals and the way journalists and writers think about football is uh, you know it's always the story and you know it, it there's there's no um, I don't know how to say it but when when people were going around, the reporters asking other players who deserves to win the Ballon d'Or, pretty much every one of them said Messi, even before it was announced. So um, I think the pros look at it in that perspective. And I think they um, look, football's about moments. And he, this year, gave us the best moments. I mean, there's an argument. I don't want to discredit Haaland's season, but he didn't score in a final. He didn't score in a semi-final. Messi scored in the, the round of 16, the, the quarterfinals, the semi-finals and the finals and the penalty shootout in the final. Um, and he gave two of the most insane assists I've ever seen at a World Cup, um, the Netherlands one and the Croatia one. So it wasn't just like he scored penalties. You know, the guy was genuinely nine or ten out of ten most games in that World Cup, apart from the Saudi Arabia game. So um, yeah, I don't think we'll see a World Cup campaign like that again. Just the four penalties for Messi in that World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Four penalties and, and what three three goals and what five assists? Yeah, no, no, it was, it was a top campaign. I'm not, I'm, I'm joking. It was a top, yeah. um, World Cup campaign. Did he deserve it? Um, forget their names. I've got a player who won the treble, um, top scorer in Europe. He won every competition he could in his first season. I've got a player who won the World Cup. But I get it, you know, Messi, it's a legacy award, you know, that, and that's, that is fair, you know, it happens in every sport. So, which, which one would I rather choose? Um, I think there'll be, if, if Harlem win it, I think people would be complaining as well. I, I would I would have probably gone Harlem, to be fair, because I, I think he was the best player in the world last season. So, um, but uh, Messi winning it. Yeah. I, do, I hear do, you it. Think, I, um, do, do you think, hmm. do you think he was the best player in the world? Yeah, because I, I, I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I understand that point of view. Um, but for me, he's not the best player in his team. So how can he be the best player in the world? Oh, I thought, I thought you thought you were the best player in his team. Anyway, De Bruyne's um, the best player in that team. Yeah, you know, he said Harlan a few months ago. But I think Harlan's the best goal scorer. So I guess what he offers is probably the best. But I think De Bruyne, I think De Bruyne's probably the best, the best player in that team. Yeah, yeah. De Bruyne's the best player in the, that team, but Haaland was better than De Bruyne last season. Let's be real. Like De Bruyne um, only really got going late towards last season, hence why he was fourth in the Ballon d'Or, not third or second. Uh, underrated player. No, if, even if De Bruyne won Ballon d'Or, I actually wouldn't have. Been, I wouldn't have been mad, you know, because I do think he's mm. worthy of being 
having that tag as the best player in the world. What, what about uh, Rodri? A DM's never going to win it, but Rodri won the treble and he won an international trophy with Spain and he scored yeah. in both finals, did he not? Yeah, has, has a shout, has a shout. Rodri Ballon d'Or, nah, man, because Rodri wasn't the best player in the world. Like, yeah. he has a shout, but, you know, intangible wise, nah, he wasn't the best player in the world. Like, Haaland, come on, man. Haaland, at the start of last season as well, unbelievable. Like, you just, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't know, maybe it's the way I view football, but it, it don't move me that much, I'll be real. Can I just say with that though, like with a lot of your counterpoints, yeah, Haaland's got the goals, but I think you could argue Messi wasn't Argentina's best player. Like, I, I've said you it before, argue, but that, that, that argue, Argentina man. team, they went into that tournament 35 games unbeaten, and you're telling me it was a Messi carry job, and I, like yeah. they were a very good team as a whole, so I don't want to hear like oh like on that on Harlan's that thirty by and Rodri the... and De Bruyne, but Messi's like literally carrying face... Argentina yeah. on the back. On that thirty-five game unbeaten streak, how many goals and assists did Messi get? Like forty-five, forty-six. Yeah, and you, I'm, <laughs> same I'm sorry, as Harlan. Like... No, listen, I'm not saying Argentina. I'm not saying it's a carry job. Me- like it was a good team, but there, there is no way you can tell me Messi wasn't the best player by far in that team. There's no way you can say that, man. Um, as much as you could try to say that about Haaland, like uh, De Bruyne was being chopped and changed throughout the season, whether he starts, whether he's um, on the bench. He or Haaland he was really every good. important game. Haaland was there, and he, he... same as De Bruyne. Might... De Bruyne got rested against like Bournemouth and teams like that. But every big game, De Bruyne was there. Every big game, Bernardo Silva was there. Every big game, Rodri was there. Every big game, Gundogan was there as well. People forget about him. Perhaps you know how many how many huge goals did he score back in the last season. Um, yeah, Gundogan should have been in the top ten. I don't know why yeah. it wasn't. If, if but, it wasn't, um, if it wasn't for Gundogan, Harlan doesn't have a treble. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah, and if it wasn't but, for Martinez, Messi doesn't have a World Cup. Like, yeah, so Mar- Mar- <laughs> Martinez won won the best goalkeeper award, which again I have absolutely no issue with. Yeah, I'm sure there's so many other moments. If I actually went back and looked, that you could probably say that with almost any player that started for Argentina. The, the bottom line is though, if Messi doesn't score that that goal against Mexico, Argentina get grouped. Uh, yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's what you put more stock in the World Cup or or or, or the club campaign. Yeah, the World Cup. Um, man. I don't know, man. That in, that City haven't won the Champions League in how long? So many attempts. Haaland clearly was the difference, bro. Whoever he scored in the final. Or semi final, the difference between last season when they had Real Madrid in the semi finals went out, whereas this season they had Real Madrid and went through. And yes, Harlan didn't score, but Harlan's in the team, bro. It's a different team, he's he changed that team. Um, at, if, at the start, it was for the worst, but then it was for the better. If I'm being so ultra, you don't need to go that much deep yeah. into it, man. Like, he, he does, just, he was unbelievable. Like, no, nah, he, yeah. he was, and you don't. And look, maybe if I'm being ultra critical, I'd say I think other teams got worse rather than rather than he yeah, did maybe, make a difference. But I, I don't think Madrid were as good as they were the year before. I don't think Bayern Munich were, uh, were, were as good as the year before. Mm. PSG was a toxic mess. Um, you know, other te- Arsenal weren't in it and they were their main challenges in the, in the league. Liverpool weren't them, themselves last year either. Um, I think the mm. teams that actually won the league, like Napoli, won the Serie A, but they're not... I, I, they, they would have got top four in the Premier League, probably. They wouldn't have They wouldn't have been top two, though, I don't think. And that's... that's Obviously, I love Napoli, so... Um, like, I don't even want to disrespect what they achieved because what they achieved is great. But I, ju- I just think what, what Messi achieved was something... I, I personally, watching football, I've never seen anything like that in terms of genuinely watching a, a football player who doesn't play for my team or my country and, and genuinely just being in complete awe of what the guy's doing on the football pitch. I don't yeah, think Haaland's nice. ever going to be like that. It's fair, it's fair, you know, it's fair. I just think, you know, the last thing I'll say is, I know Harlan isn't, ultimately, like, he, he he makes the game look so simple, scoring easy goals. And it looks so easy. If it was so easy, why wouldn't everyone else do it? That's what no, I'm facts. saying. Facts, facts, you know. facts. But, facts. But, yeah, that's it. One hour Ooh. 23. It's been a great discussion. Thank you, boys, for coming on. Right, um, we're going to do more of this. Potential midweek episode after the Champions League. Who knows? Will United be in? Will they be out of the Champions League? Probably not. But yeah. <laughs> they get knocked out, okay. emergency meeting, and we're having yeah. Seb on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if we get... Yeah, we're going to get the absolute A-star list for that. Um, 
But yeah, if you've made this episode, thank you for listening. Uh, please hit the likes, um, hit the subscribes, hit the follows on all the socials. Check out the TikToks, the Instagrams. Um, you guys have actually blown the hell out of that Instagram um, reel. Um, you, you seem to have that rash with Fury a lot. So um, thank you guys for that. Um, but yeah, until next time, guys, Streets Won't Forget podcast. We're out. Peace. Take care. Yeah.